Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Krishna Giri Murthy and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. Very excited about my guest this week. He is a man who has transformed musicals with his amazing hit Hamilton, which was on stage in 2015 and still running strong now with all sorts of transformative effects. But we're talking to him today because he has got a movie on Netflix at the moment about another star of musicals, Jonathan Larson. The film is called Tick, Tick, Boom, and it's the story of Jonathan Larson. Lynn manuel Miranda, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining us. Thrilled to be here. And, and we're talking to you today because of your new movie, Tick, Tick, Boom, which is the story of the amazing creator of Rents, Jonathan Larson. Why, why are you directing? <laughs> why am I directing? <laughs> um, well, because Jonathan Larson changed my world, uh, to bring it back to the theme of your show. Um, I'd always loved musicals. I... Um, was lucky enough to get cast in the school play when I was doing that in middle school and high school. Um, but for my 17th birthday, um, I saw Rent and it totally rocked my world. I, musicals always took place in some other time and some other land. Um, if I did see a musical set in New York, it was always a period piece. Uh, it was all white folks up on stage. And here comes Rent. Um, and it is the most contemporary music I've ever heard in a musical. It's the most diverse cast I've ever seen on a stage. Uh, and it was the show that made me feel like I had permission to write a musical, to have the audacity to write a musical uh, someday. And so the fact that the composer of that work, uh, creator of that work, Jonathan Larson, didn't live to see the success of that show. Um, and in fact, wrote a semi-autobiographical piece uh, in his early 30s called Tick, Tick, Boom. Um, that, that show felt like a message in a bottle to me. And I just felt like, um, you know, this, I, I, I wanna make this movie because um, I know uh, the, the effect of Jonathan's art and music on my life. And I, want, um, I wanted to hit other artists with that same clarity of force. There's some amazing footage on YouTube of you singing as well from many years ago. I was lucky enough to be in an, a, a, a five performance off-Broadway production of Tick, Tick, Boom in 2014, just a few months before uh, the premiere of Hamilton off-Broadway. Um, I was 34 years old. I was on the outer edge of the age I could be <laughs> to play uh, Jonathan Larson on the, on the cusp of 30. Um, and I thought that was kind of the end of my journey with that show. Um, and... Um, you know, the, my my producer, Julie O, saw me in that production and quietly went about getting the film rights to Tick, Tick, Boom and getting the permission from the Larson estate. Um, and so when she presented me with that, I never responded to an email so fast in my life. I said, I feel like I've been waiting, I've been preparing all my life uh, to help tell Jonathan's story because Jonathan is the one who prepared the way for me. Andrew Garfield is stunning in this film. I mean, I'm sure he's going to win a lot of awards. He's stunning full um, stop. He's also very good in this movie. <laughs> yeah. He's also very good, but he'd, he'd never sung before, and that's particularly surprising. So how, how did you get him to sing? How did you make sure he could do it? Listen, it's not like I'm taking a chance on some kid fresh out of RADA. Uh, it's Andrew Garfield, one of the best actors of his generation. I, I knew I needed a theater animal to play Jonathan Larson because we were gonna, 
in this telling, we were going to see some of the most intimate moments of his life. And um, I needed a performer who could sing and play piano and sing to the back row of the rafters uh, for much of the film. I was lucky enough to see him in Angels in America at the National Theater uh, in London. And you know, that's your day, right? You see Millennium Approaches for the matinee, you eat dinner at the National, you see part two, it's an eight hour experience. And I watched Andrew perform the role of Prior Walter with his rib cage cracked open. He was like a giant beating heart on that stage. And he did everything. You know, that role demands everything from you. Um, and I just left feeling like that guy can do anything. And if we give him the time and the resources to learn to sing, he'll learn to sing. He'll learn to do whatever he wants to do. Because um, what you get, what I knew about Andrew prior to working with him was his level of total commitment. And, and I was lucky enough that he gave that to Jonathan Lars. There's an amazing attention to detail as well, isn't there, in terms of things like his apartment and the bookcase, the sagging bookcase. How important was that to you? It was really important. You know, one of the other um, byproducts of getting to play Jonathan in, in that production I did in 2014 was going from backstage to the post-show reception where I, it was like the last scene of the movie Big Fish. Um, it was like, hi, I'm Matt O'Grady. I'm, I was Jonathan Larson's best friend. Hi, my name is Janet. I was Jonathan's girlfriend when he was writing Tick, Tick, Boom. Hi, my, you know, meeting his friends and family and the community of people who loved and knew Jonathan, um, who are all still around and go to performances of Tick, Tick, Boom because they have John back for 90 minutes uh, when that story is being told. And so um, I knew that we had that community as a resource. And before Stephen Levinson and I embarked on uh, the screenplay, um, we, we interviewed and we had lunch with all those folks to get those stories, to bring as much of Jonathan to the screen uh, as possible. And that extended to Alex Lando, our incredible production designer, um, who faithfully recreated that apartment, uh, the Moondance Diner, which we had to build from scratch, um, and really a bygone village because the village in New York doesn't look like that anymore. Bohemians can't afford those apartments uh, anymore. We had to bring back the New York of 1990. And that was a real joy. Of course, I mean, this story and Jonathan Larson's story is at least partly about having to wait for your genius to be recognized. That's not something you really had to do, though, is it? I mean, you, sure. you, your, your genius was recognized very quickly. Well, you, you speak of genius as if it's this static thing, but I wasn't any good at writing musicals in my 20s. I wrote six musicals called In the Heights. The last one is the one that made it to Broadway. The one uh, that I wrote in college would have been laughed out of the room. Uh, and what is so thrilling about Tick, Tick, Boom is that it's a portrait of, it's a self-portrait of an artist as a young man. And um, it's an artist in the process of finding their voice, mourning the loss of their 20s because Jonathan spent his 20s writing a musical no one wanted to produce. And he took that heartbreak and that disappointment and made art out of even that. That to me is what's very hopeful about the piece is that this is not the story of a genius um, writing their masterpiece. This is the story of an artist um, picking himself back up off the floor and figuring out how to take lessons uh, from the disappointment of the last work and getting up and making the next one. And the fact that rent is on the horizon for him, I find endlessly inspiring. And I think it resonates with viewers as well, because it says, maybe my best work is ahead of me. And maybe the heartbreaks and disappointments are valuable in some other form. Was that something you were able to hold on to? I mean, you say you did lots of versions of In the Heights. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and I also have the virtue of having... Um, lived as a struggling songwriter in my 20s, and also having seen Tick, Tick, Boom at age 21, when I was senior at university, I saw the posthumous three-person production of it that, that premiered in the fall of 2001, and it was like a sneak preview of my 20s. It was like a guidebook uh, in a weird way. Um, it was, um, you know, Raul Esparza played Jonathan in that production, and it felt like a message in a bottle just for me. It was like, hey, that, that pretty girl who was your girlfriend, who's a great actress and singer, she's not going to be an actress and singer when she grows up. She's going to get a real job. Uh, and your friends who are more talented than you, they're going to get jobs that give them health insurance. And it's just going to be you um, banging your head against the wall of your childhood dream. And are you okay writing musicals if the world never notices, because the world never noticed while Jonathan was alive. It was just getting started when he was taken from us. And, and I had to 
answer those questions at 21 and be okay with that and be like, there's another timeline where I'm not talking to you and I'm still a teacher at my old high school and I'm still writing musicals at night because that's that's that was my calling. But you have to be okay with the world not noticing because you can't control what the world does. You can only control the thing you're making. So when when had you decided that that's what you were going to do? You were going to dedicate your life to to music and musicals. It's a very short line from seeing Rent to trying my, to write my own musicals because Jonathan showed me that was possible. I don't think it's an accident that Rent is about this community facing gentrification. And two years later, I start writing in the Heights about this community facing gentrification with all the musical influences that I grew up with. You know, I did not grow up with the same musical landscape as Jonathan, but I did take the lesson uh, that Jonathan advanced that popular music and theater music can be friends. Um, and so I brought hip hop and I brought Latin music into my my version of, of, um, of that story. But then part of it was also practical. I went to university to study film and theater and I learned when I got there, that film is a more expensive major than theater. You are expected to finance your own senior short film. And I knew my parents were killing themselves just to pay tuition. Whereas if you're a theater major, they give you the couple of hundred bucks for your costumes and your lights. It is subsidized by the school itself. So I, I dropped the film major and became a theater major out of practicality and, and an awareness of my parents' financial burdens and understanding I have to leave with more than a degree under my arm. I have to leave with plays and manuscripts that I can show the world and say, no, I really am a writer. Here's what I've written. Did your parents always love what you were doing? Again, there's some video on YouTube of, I think, your father singing with you, clearly a charismatic man, but but, but a man who worked in a very different world of politics. My father worked in politics. Uh, my mother is a psychologist. But what I benefit from is the fact that my father's uncle, my great uncle, Ernesto Concepcion, was a beloved and celebrated theater actor uh, in Puerto Rico um, on the island uh, where he grew up. And so that was a life that was available to him, but my dad is way too practical to ever actually pursue that uh, as a living. So in a lot of ways, I am my father's wildest dreams, even though all during high school, he was pushing me to take math courses that I would fail um, and, and pushing me to go into law school. And it was never going to happen uh, because for better or worse, I, I cannot care about what I do not care about. Um, and you can't make someone care if they don't. So law school is never gonna happen. I, I was lucky enough to marry a lawyer. Uh, so that has mollified my parents a bit. And given you some financial security. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, as, as much as um, they encouraged me to find a real job, they also never missed a play. Uh, and they were very supportive of the work I was making uh, as I was making it. So um, they, they, did, they were there for the ride. What was it like growing up? I mean, you must have been surrounded by politics. Your dad worked Fred Koch, the New York mayor. I mean, were you were you political? Were you an activist at all? No, I think it's like being the butcher's son. Like if you're the butcher's kid, you're more likely than not, you're gonna be a vegan when you grow up. For me, registering people to vote and um, handing out flyers on election day was my version of the paper route. It was my version of childhood chores. And I didn't ever think about what lessons I'd absorbed until I started writing Hamilton. And, you know, uh, one of the interesting, unanticipated um, outcomes of, of Hamilton's reception was a real um, kind of interest from the political class. There is a weird innate understanding of legacy and power and chasing political power that I understood all of those characters were doing. And I think that comes as a result of being the kid with the coloring book while decisions are being made uh, in the kitchen. Alexander Hamilton. My name is Alexander Hamilton. And there's a million things I haven't done. Just you wait, just you wait. When you look back at that Hamilton period from 2015, I mean, I know you talked about it loads at the time, but when you, now you've got a bit of perspective. I wonder whether, it, you know, whether you've drawn any conclusions about what was going on there. Because it was an astonishing moment, as you say, where, which transformed how people thought of musicals. Well, that's the part I never anticipated because from my perspective, Hamilton has many antecedents and lots of um, ancestors and precursors. Tommy, Kale, and I always say the grandparents of Hamilton as a work are Sweeney Todd, 
Gypsy, um, Evita, and Les Miserables. We've seen history in musicals, Les Miserables and Evita. We've seen um, characters with a really strong central protagonist with Gypsy and, and, and Sweeney Todd. We've seen sung through musicals, just like Les Miserables. So I think I was surprised by how transformative people perceived the show as because I'm, I'm chasing my heroes. I'll, I'll never forget when Andrew Lloyd Webber came to the show and he was really knocked flat by it. But I said, don't. Don't be. This is my Jesus Christ superstar. You know, just like Judas begins Jesus Christ superstar, Aaron Burr uh, begins Hamilton. Um, and I really thought this was going to be a concept album first. I really thought I was getting my JCS on. Um, and then it became a musical sort of despite itself in its evolution and its iterations. So I was as surprised as anyone, but I, I do think the secret sauce of the show is it wrestles with the same thing Tick Tick Boom wrestles with, which is what are we meant to be doing with our time here? Can you imagine performing it again? Would you ever want to? I can't imagine it right now. Um, I'm more in need of a nap than anyone you've ever met. But yeah, I can imagine it someday. I would love to. I think the next time I, I perform it, and I, I, I joked about this as I was leaving the show. I was like, guys, I'm going to be like Ted Neely in Jesus Christ Superstar. I'm going to do this as long as you want to see me in it. And I, I reserve the right to jump back whenever. But since the release of the film on Disney+, Plus, I really get pangs of doing it again with the folks who were with me at the beginning. I'd love to do it again with David or with Leslie. Uh, or with Renee or Pippa, um, that was um, that was a really special time. How have you chosen your projects since then? Because I suppose after Hamilton, you could have done anything you wanted. Um, but you know, you've chosen really interesting things, whether it's Disney or um, Tick Tick Boom and, and directing. So how do you go about deciding what to do? I think when the world begins to offer you things, which is first of all a very rare privilege and luxury, and one I'm very aware of. Um, the only choice is what can you learn from? Because I believe we all have stories inside us that are longing to get out and and you you owe a fidelity to the stories that only you feel you can tell. And then there are the opportunities where you go, I'm going to be a better artist as a result of working on this. And I don't think it's, it's not an accident that um, I went and worked with a lot of other musical directors uh, after Hamilton. I said yes to Rob Marshall uh, and Mary Poppins Returns because Rob Marshall made one of the best movie musicals of all time with Chicago. I wanted to be there and watch how he directs an original musical. And I learned a lot on that experience. And then I think the third year of the film school I couldn't afford was watching John M. Chu uh, direct my work and adapt in the heights for the big screen and, and the swings he took uh, and the audacity of the space uh, that movie takes up. That's a big Hollywood musical, one I never thought would have been possible in my humble little neighborhood of Washington Heights, but we're there on location at the pool I used to swim in as a child, but there's 500 extras and he's doing an Esther Williams number. This is the moment where you do better than me because you can see a future that I can't. That, that's the film school I wanted but couldn't afford. And 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 that that very consciously informed my choices to prepare me to direct to take boom. In terms of mission, is, is your mission to leave people feeling uplifted, happy, to make them think? Or, or does it depend on the project? It depends on the project. You know, I I I definitely didn't know if people would leave Hamilton feeling uplifted. <laughs> All I knew about the guy when I picked up the biography was that, you know, his son died in a duel and he died in a duel three years later. And I thought, how do you walk into that? Uh, and that was enough curiosity to get the book off the shelf of the bookshop and into my hands. One of the things, again, that I, uh, one of the lessons that we, the many lessons I take from Steve Sondheim, who I'm still mourning and the world is still mourning, is you should do the things that scare you. You should chase the stories that scare you. And if you're you're not sure you're going to be able to pull off because uh, there's there's lessons in in failure and there's lessons in um, in in trying to do something that feels beyond your reach um, because you you will learn something about yourself and and something interesting will emerge from the process. I mean, what one of the obviously very interesting things about Hamilton was the people it put on stage and putting people of color and and, and black actors. Um, center stage. I wonder how, how lasting an effect do you think that has had on, on Broadway and on theater more, more broadly? I don't know yet because it's still, we're still in its infancy in terms of the wake of the success of Hamilton. I do know that um, because of the success of Hamilton, I think it has allowed 
the powers that be to think more laterally about the way they cast their their projects. I I, I know of one filmmaker who I really deeply admire, uh, who came to me and said, when I pitched this project, and it was a beloved project that you know had white characters, uh, and she said to the studio, I'm doing a Hamilton on this. And if you don't want a Hamilton on this, um, I'm not the person for it. By which she meant I am centering actors of color uh, in this in this property, even though historically that hasn't been the case. And that's that's a thrilling uh, side effect. You know, you want your stage to reflect your world. And that was something I felt when I saw Rent at 17. I just felt, oh my God, this show set in New York actually looks like the New York I live in, as opposed to seeing Chorus Line and seeing you know, a lot of white people, one black guy and two Latinos on stage, <laughs> as opposed to just being the one or the two on the stage. It looks like the subway I take every day. It looks like the street I walk down. And um, um, I, I'm very proud of, of that legacy um, of the show. Because you said in a different context about In the Heights that you had written it because you felt unseen. What, what did you mean by that? I was a student of musical theater. I I studied what works existed in the canon. And if you are a Puerto Rican man looking at what roles there are for you in the world, you've got Paul from A Chorus Line, The Sharks, end of list. I, I really kind of had this crashing feeling of your dream role doesn't exist. Um, and if you want to work in this business, you've got to create your own work. And I'm lucky that I had, again, Jonathan Larson as a guide um, in that respect. I also was a huge fan of Robert Rodriguez, um, who uh, is a filmmaker who wrote his own ticket to Hollywood by proving he could do a lot with a little. He made El Mariachi for $8,000, and that was his calling card. I responded to the fear of the roles don't exist and the work isn't being created by, by feeling empowered to create my own work because I chose good heroes. You, you use that phrase in a, in a, a remarkable and very gracious statement um, in response to how some people felt about the In the Heights movie um, and there were people talking about colorism. Did, did that come as a, as a big shock to you? No, not really. That, w- that, that conversation about colorism is one of the most important byproducts of you know, the racial reckoning that was happening uh, in our country in 2020. And it was a big topic of conversation amidst our community. And again, In the Heights is made prior to that conversation. We filmed that movie in 2019. And so I, I knew those, 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 that conversation was going to happen. And if one of the byproducts is a big open conversation about colorism, which is a hundred years of frustration with colorism in the media that also kind of, and this is the chance to talk about it, then that that has to be the legacy. And that's the moment uh, in which we talk about it. And um, again, like I, I I carry that with me and I, I, I'm, I'm grateful for that conversation. And I carry that with me to every project um, going forward. The other thing that has struck me as really interesting over the last few years, I mean, during the Hamilton success and this, this show that makes you think about the founding of the nation and makes you think quite deeply about the principles behind America. America was going through the Trump years and great tur- you know, turbulence in, 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 in politics. And were you, I mean, how, how comfortable were you in America during those years, given your own political background and your, uh, your family background? I think it was a pretty scary time uh, for a lot of folks because um, we had someone in charge who um, didn't really care about the norms uh, and tact and diplomacy. uh, And we learned how many things that we thought were kind of cornerstones of our democracy were actually just norms to be broken. You know, you're watching someone who's like, no, I don't want to tell you how much I made. I don't want to show you my taxes. I don't feel like it. And suddenly we have someone and we don't understand any of the ethical pulls on that person because we have no sense of their financial history. Uh, That's just one example. And so it was kind of a scary and norm shattering time. Uh, Again, I I did not come to writing Hamilton with a, a, a huge understanding of history prior to it. I think one of the secrets in the sauce is that I'm learning about the pettiness of our founders and their flaws and their contradictions as I'm trying to figure out how to musicalize in it. And one of the biggest takeaways from the show is, twas ever thus. You know, we get 
these precedent setting debates because these guys didn't like each other um, or because, you know, they didn't want slavery to be in question. So let's put the capital in the South where we'll have more votes and we don't have to travel too far from home. Again, the messiness and the flaws of our founders um, are contradictions and flaws we're still constantly grappling with. And I, I don't think that change changes under one administration uh, or another. So do you feel America is any more secure now or is it still in an insecure place? I don't know that it's ever secure at any given time. It is based on some beautiful ideals and it has never reached those ideals. You know, to say all men are created equal and not have all men be equal, even at your founding, um, is to constantly be reaching for ideals that are out of reach. And so we take steps backwards and we take steps sideways. But there are beautiful ideas in that founding that, um, you know, you hope um, we are we are inching towards bit by bit. And sometimes we take big steps backwards. But again, I don't know where we're at. We're, we're in unprecedented waters amidst a global pandemic and a climate crisis and, and a million other things. I, I, I don't know whether you still have family in Puerto Rico. I mean, what did they think about you doing a, a musical about the founding of America? I don't think they had any kind. I mean, my family in Puerto Rico is always just kind of like, oh, Ling Manuel and his crazy ideas. It's funny, your question makes me think of when I was when I would spend my summers there with my grandparents and my grandfather uh, worked as a manager of a bank. Uh, this local community credit union, and he used to borrow the surveillance VHS camera so that I could make movies there uh, in the summer. And if you watch my movies from when I was a kid, in between the videos, you'll see people online (laughs) at the bank. I'm filming (laughs) over surveillance cassettes. Um, So, you know, what I get from my family in Puerto Rico is, is just... Um, this incredible unconditional love and and support and it, it's one of the reasons I always bring my work there you know if there was you know in the heights was the first equity tour ever to go to the island you know we were able to bring Hamilton there in the wake of Hurricane Maria and 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 raise 15 million dollars in uh, relief funds for arts organizations uh, and arts groups and artists on the island so you know that's that's sort of my my relationship with with my family and the island and are you writing at the moment? Do you, I mean, are you always writing? I am in the process of clearing my desk. Uh, you know, you make plans and God laughs. And I had planned two movies last year and two movies this year, and they all fell into this year. My plan is to take the longest nap anyone's ever had uh, and take a nice long vacation at the top of next year with my wife. You know, again, I'm, I'm mourning Steve Sondheim's death like everybody else's. And the voice I hear loudest in my head is that voice he gave to Charlie Kringus in his show, Merrily We Roll Along, where he said, tell that man to get back to his piano. So I want to get writing again and I want to um, sort of be home and, and be there for my family as I start making the next thing. We have an end question on this podcast, which is if you could just change the world in any way, how would you change it? It's a broad question. Yeah. Um, the, the climate crisis really weighs on my mind. I have young kids. I want them to uh, inherit the, the world I, I grew up in. If I could change the world, I would, I would reverse the damaging effects uh, man has, has wrought uh, on, on the world. I would just get, on, get my Superman on and spin, get out, fly, spin the world backwards um, and, and put in saner, saner um, you know, you name it, uh, emission standards, uh, energy sources, uh, so that our kids uh, uh, have the same time in, in the world that, that we had. Well, good luck with it. Lin-Manuel Miranda, thank you very much indeed. It's been a pleasure to talk to you and good luck with Tick, Tick, Boom, which is on Netflix now and is very enjoyable. Yeah, thank you. Our producer is Faye White. You can watch all of these interviews on the Channel 4 News YouTube channel. Until next time, bye-bye.